Uh-huh. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have uh, Charles Stacy Harris here talking about Bayesian thinking and Bayes rule. Uh, this is something that I've done multiple times at my in-person meetups because we have found, I found it very difficult mm-hmm. to convey the spirit of mathematics to people who are not that familiar with mathematics. But I do strongly believe that learning of mathematics and getting a sense, not just of some conclusions of mathematics, but being able to think mathematically is a tremendous asset and almost almost required in the modern world because what it makes, uh, the the range of what it makes possible. So Bayes' rule is one of my favorite uh, favorite parts of mathematics and I'm delighted to have Stacy uh, talk about it. So the format is Stacy is going to talk about Bayes' rule. Then I'm going to ask a few questions. And uh, from the point of view of the audience, I'm going to make my own observations. And then we are going to go directly into breakout rooms to discuss everything that has been presented. And then you come back and talk about both your takeaways and you can put questions on the table. And as and when you give your takeaways and questions, uh, Stacy and I will respond to that. So this is, we're trying to do a deep dive into understanding the spirit of Bayesian thinking. If you just walk away with the spirit of Bayesian thinking, uh, what does it mean to think this way? Um, that would be something. Then you can pick up all the details and learn on your own. But just try to grasp what it means to think uh, you know, along these lines. All right, um, and it is meant to be interactive. So, and there are no stupid questions. So we want every, you know, we want to really understand uh, where you're coming from and try to talk to you about what this concept is, okay? So with that, over to you, Stacy. All right, well, thanks. Uh, so uh, there are times where I can't help myself being a little bit silly about this stuff. So I have to make one pop culture reference and just say, you know, I'm all about that days. Okay. And if you didn't get it, that's okay. <laughs> um, but just by way of introduction, uh, so I'm Stacy. I'm an uh, uh, application developer at Microsoft. Uh, and uh, I would say a rusty mathematician to a degree. I still have a ton of math books. I still read math stuff. Uh, but um, it's you know sort of, uh, I've gotten away from some of the theoretical. Uh, but hopefully, you know, this will be uh, some, uh, be good, and we can uh, make this one as much fun as we did with the calculus one, which you haven't, if you haven't seen that one, was kind of fun. Um, but I wanted to start with just kind of a uh, a basic idea of what we talk about when we talk about probabilities, because Bayes' rule is about probabilities. It's about uh, essentially this this idea of how how strong your belief in something is in the face of evidence uh, and what probabilities you assign to things. So while it, it's sort of mathematical, it also has uh, a little component of it that uh, is really about a gut feel and, and tuning your thinking around that gut feel as well. Uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and start with just the notion of what is probability. Um, probability actually kind of it, it, just an intuitive definition, when you think about the chance of something happening, classic example that everyone uses is uh, you roll, uh, you know, you have a die uh, and you roll the die. Hopefully you can kind of see, I'll make those a little darker. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, the die has spots on it, you roll it, and some number is going to come up on top because die being a little cube, it's gonna fall, it's gonna land, you get a number on the top. And really intuitively, this is like super easy for people to understand. The idea that, oh, I'm gonna roll that and it's gonna be one of those numbers. What's the chance, what's the probability that it's going to be any of those numbers? And a common way of kind of speaking about that is to just say, oh, there's a one in six chance of it landing on any given number. So that's kind of a really simple way to understand probability. That one in six, which we would write that mathematically as a one sixth chance uh, of those things coming up. You can also express that as percentage if you want uh, as well. 
But that's the basic idea. Things get a little more complicated now. If I had uh, two uh, instead of one, if I had two die instead of one, um, now I would come up and let's, we're just gonna write the numbers this time, but I would have one of the die might come up with one through six on it. Uh, and then I'm just gonna draw on the side here, the other die, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then we can start to fill out a table of say the sums. So now if both die uh, come up with one, then my total is going to be a two. And if I get a one and a two, then I'm gonna have a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, uh, and so on. And you can start to see, well, I can fill this out. We'll have a three, four, five, uh, a six, a seven, an eight. And uh, you can keep filling this out all the way down. And if I need to, I can, I, I can fill out the whole thing, but uh, I'll find my mouse here. Can fill out the whole thing, but uh, eventually you get to this last one, which is going to be seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Now you have some interesting things that are going on here. For example, how many different ways can you roll a two? Well, if you look at this table and you look, two only shows up in the table one time. So, uh, so that gives two a really low probability of coming up. If you look at twelve. 12 only comes up one time. So if you look at the total number of possible rolls, and you can find out kind of, okay, what's the probability uh, that I'll get any given, um, any given number here? So hopefully that gives you some intuitive sense of uh, what we talk about when we talk about probabilities. It's that chance of something happening related to all of the possible outcomes. Uh, and hopefully that makes some sense. Um, let's see, if that doesn't make sense, uh, feel free to um, give me a shout and tell me what doesn't make sense there. I'm trying to see if I can see the chat at the same time. I told you my Zoom foo is not very good. Uh, so I'm- Stacy, yeah, I will go ahead and monitor the chat. And if okay. there is anything in the chat that you need to respond to, I will bring it up on oh. on audio. So I'll, I'll be the transducer from, I'll, I'll be the, voice, uh, the text to voice recognizer for you. All right, I appreciate that. Um, okay, another uh, way that sometimes people think about uh, probabilities is with, uh, with odds. So let's say uh, you have a, a population of people and uh, you know, some, uh, some of the percentage of the people uh, maybe have uh, dark hair, black hair, and you know, some percentage of people have blonde hair or something like that. You would actually divide that population up into uh, groups. So, you know, the group with say dark hair and, you know, over here, the group with light hair. And when you look at that, maybe there are three people here and five people here. You might express that as a proportion uh, or a ratio, three to five. The total population is eight but you're expressing this as sort of three to five, meaning three people with this uh, uh, attribute, five people with that attribute. And you'll see some things where, we, where it is actually a little more convenient to think about probabilities or ratio or um, odds in that way, uh, because it gives you a sort of more intuitive feel for uh, this side is bigger, how much bigger, uh, how much smaller. Um, so, that said, hopefully those you know sort of basic definitions will get those out of the way really quickly. Uh, I want to introduce you to uh, an interesting problem in probability. It's not sort of you won't directly see this uh, related to Bayes' rule when we start, although there is a way to relate it uh, later. My goal here is just build your intuition about evidence and probability. The problem uh, was actually uh, made really popular by a lady named, um, uh, I think it's Marianne Vosavant. She, uh, super high IQ person, I guess at one point had like the record high IQ in the world and she wrote a column uh, in a magazine and she proposed this problem. And it even had people who were sort of PhD mathematicians writing back debating this problem. The problem is called the Monty Hall problem. And again, pop culture reference, I guess, 
Uh, for people who don't know, Monty Hall was the host of a game show called Let's Make a Deal. And at some point during the show, the contestant uh, would have choice of picking a prize that was behind some doors, these hidden doors. And all that you know is that behind two of the doors, so there are two goats, and behind one door, there's a new car. You don't know which door, but you know that somewhere behind uh, some door, there is a new car and the others, those are goats. So I want everybody to pick a door. And everybody just, you can, you don't have to put it in the chat if you want to, you can, but, um, but pick a door. Um, okay, so what Monty does is everybody picks a door. It looks like we're getting a couple of two. So let's say the contestant picks this door. This is the pick. Now Monty knows where the goats are. Monty comes along and says, Oh, by the way, contestant, there is a goat. I'm going to draw a goat. I'm not very good at drawing. So my goat is going to be a stick goat. So here's a stick goat. Hey, that's a great stick goat, right? Monty says there's a goat behind door number one. Now you as a contestant have to decide. Do you want to stay with door number two, one you picked? Or do you want to go to door number three? What do you do? Do you stay or do you switch? So go ahead and pop your answer in the chat. Stay or switch. OK. Oh, by the way, I saw there were some questions about the matrix that I drew. That was just so you could see the sums on a dice. That wasn't really anything else. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, so that you had, you could see all 36 outcomes um, and in different ways. Um, okay. So uh, for the people who say stay or switch, oh, there's even 50 50, so uh, no reason to switch. Um, okay, let's think about that for a moment, though. When did this become 50-50? If Monty had not told you where the goat was, what's your probability of picking a goat? If I hadn't told you anything else, when you first made that pick, before you knew where the goat was, what was the probability of picking a goat? So two out of three, two out of three, great. 66.66%. So how likely is it compared to the car is, yeah, you, you're more likely, you probably picked a goat. You probably picked a goat. That did not change when I revealed to you that there was a goat behind door number one. You still probably picked a goat. What I did was I now gave you some new evidence that said, hey, even though you probably picked a goat, here's the other one. You're actually much better off switching at this point point to door number three. Uh, and in fact, door number three, that's where we have our shiny new car, which again, I can't draw. So uh, a car is a box with some wheels. Two thirds of the time, switching is going to give you a better result. One third of the time, you probably should have, you should stick with it. Here's a way to kind of make that intuition uh, a little bit stronger for you. And I know there are probably people who are going, wait a minute. Uh, What's going on? Um, let's see. Let's make this a little bit stronger for you. Let's say that you are on the game show and we have one thousand doors behind so we have nine hundred and ninety nine goats and one car. Now, I ask you to pick a door. Just think of it in your head. If you want to write it in the chat, that's cool, but they're all numbered. You pick a door. How likely is it that you picked a goat? It's super, 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 super likely, right? 
compared to the car, you like you you probably wouldn't want to bet on, hey, I I picked a car. But now Monty comes along and eliminates all but two doors. Let's say this one was your pick. Monty eliminates all but two doors. Are you going to stay or are you going to switch? Again, now you're you're thinking, well, it was so super likely that I picked a goat before that switching makes the most sense. What we've done is we've used evidence here to update our beliefs. Evidence has now changed what we believe or what uh, what we think may uh, be true. So you probably, in this case, your your uh, your intuition is much stronger that hey, we should switch. It's the same problem as before. It's just the numbers are different. In this case, you know, 66%. Well, okay, you know, you might decide that um, that you feel lucky and that you're going to bet on that one third chance that you picked the car. In this case, your odds of picking the car are so much lower that when Monty comes along and eliminates all but the last two doors, your intuition is, hey, I should switch. So this is kind of the core behind Bayesian thinking is this notion of new evidence updates our beliefs. It doesn't tell you how accurate your choice was at first. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, the, with uh, how you might make that initial choice, but the new evidence will update your choice. It will give you a stronger uh, sense. So hopefully that's making some sense. So um, the, the other interesting thing about this, and if we go back to, uh, and I'm going to give you another example here in a moment, if we go back to this problem. Let's say that Monty doesn't know where the goat is, right? So now we have door one, two, and three, but the, the game show host picks a door, eliminates the door, but really does not know whether there's a goat behind that door or not. Now we don't have any new evidence. So your odds kind of go back. Now you really may as well stay because you don't have any evidence to update your belief. It is kind of a 50-50 situation at that point. Um, so before we had a, uh, an event that changed our beliefs. And uh, if, we, if this were a random choice instead, it wouldn't change our beliefs. But since he knew that, that's new evidence. Okay, hopefully that's not super confusing. Um, good. And uh, good discussion in there. So yeah, this is a, a, um, an example where these states are not independent. Monty knew where the goat was. So um, you got to take that into account. You need to know uh, that he knew that. So that changes what, uh, what you believe. Okay, uh, so my next example, and this is going to kind of hopefully uh, get a little more um, into exactly what sort of the uh, uh, Bayes theorem, and, and we can even show the formula uh, if we want to look at some of the math, uh, what that looks like. This is an example that, uh, that I really like. Um, and I actually, uh, I found this um, illustrated really well uh, by, uh, on a YouTube channel called Three Blue, One Brown. Um, so if you get a chance, check out the, the channel there. Uh, but the, the example comes from, uh, two psychologists named Kahneman and Tversky. And they gave this to uh, a bunch of, uh, of people and they kind of tried to see what people's intuition uh, was on how you reason about these types of things. So the description is of a guy named Steve. And so here's, here's Steve. Um, I'm gonna draw a stick figure Steve since my artwork uh, is just so astonishing, but um, Steve is, uh, let's give him some hair here. Uh, Steve is sort of a shy person. Um, we call him shy and withdrawn is the term they use. Um, and he's really a helpful kind of guy, but little interest in people. He's an introvert. Um, and um, I guess you would call him a meek and tidy soul is the term they use. Uh, meek and tidy soul. So um, he has a, 
uh, a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. So if I asked you to, to sort of guess, would you, if Steve is a librarian or a farmer, what would be your guess? You have to categorize Steve. He's a librarian or a farmer. And I know, and this is kind of a trick question a little bit, uh, just a little bit, but meek and tidy soul, passion for order uh, and detail, need for structure. So let me see in the chat, what do you think? Is he more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? <laughs> He's more likely to be Kahneman <laughs> or Tversky. <laughs> is he a librarian or farmer? I'm not seeing all the answers. Farming is not what it used to be yet. Yeah, I think your gut, um, and depends on, on um, Oh yeah, there we go. Farmer who reads. Uh, so Claudio, brilliant. What you don't have is information about the population of both professions. How many librarians are there in the world? How many farmers are there in the world? Uh, your gut might tell you initially, oh, well, let's, you know, I, you know, people like that, they're probably librarians, but population of librarians versus farmers, when Kahneman and Tversky did uh, their uh, study was about 20 to one in favor of farmers. Today, at least uh, according to the the, uh, the video on the on uh, three blue one brown, it's more like sixty to one. I have not verified that number, but let's see what that does for us then. So that means that if we have a population of uh, librarians and farmers, let's say we have ten librarians, uh, so we'll just go ahead and and draw little boxes. Uh, let's see. Oh, geez, losing my mouse here. I think that was 10. And let's say we have 200 farmers. Uh, I'm not going to draw all 200 out, but we'll just draw 200 of those. So if we kind of just use a gut estimate of, well, we we kind of think that more librarians are going to fit this than farmers. If I just restrict my population to the population of librarians, it's probably going to be about 40% roughly. Uh, so we'll give that a number. And what's good about this is that we can change that number later. If we update that evidence, if we get better evidence, we can update that. But we kind of start with just a gut um, feel for it. And probably not as many farmers fit that. So probably be around, say, you know, 10%. Um, so uh, here we had 10, here we had 200. Uh, that fits our one to 20 um, ratio. So when you look at that, now, what, uh, what does your gut tell you? Now, where are you in this, in the uh, notion of the probability of Steve being a librarian? Well, if, um, if we go with these numbers, that means approximately four librarians in this population fit that uh, description. Approximately 20 farmers fit that description. So the probability of being a librarian given, and we usually write given as this little vertical bar, given, uh, and I'll just use the uh, word description here, the description that we gave above is four out of the 24 people who fit that description. So what I did was I added the 20 here and the four, that's the total number of people who fit that description. And so we uh, divide the number of librarians by that. 
So that's approximately, uh, what is that, 16.7% probability that um, Steve is actually a librarian. So hopefully that makes some sense. I'm gonna let that sink in for a little bit. One of the nice things, by the way, about that three blue, one brown is that uh, the, the um, graphics, the animations are really great. Um, so definitely worth uh, checking out way better than my drawings. Um, so uh, a good way to think about when to use Bayes rule and, uh, and, and some terminology here is you have some hypothesis like the idea that Steve is a librarian. And you have some evidence that you observe. And you want to use that evidence to update your hypothesis. So what you want is the probability of the hypothesis in the face of that evidence or given that evidence. That's kind of the way to think about Bayes' rule is take that hypothesis, apply the evidence, and then get the probability. The, uh, the, the tool that I used here, this little graphic that I used here, is pretty helpful, actually. You can almost always um, come up with, uh, with this drawing, even if the numbers are not great. If you just kind of visualize this idea that uh, here's my total population. Here's the um, the part of the population that meets the criteria. This is uh, the probability uh, or part of the population that meets this criteria, the hypothesis. Uh, so probability of H is going to be that fraction of the population. Then you have this section here, which we said, okay, well, what's the likelihood um, or the, the portion of this group that meets the evidence as well? So this is uh, probability that th this portion of the population meets that evidence. So what's, what fraction of librarians meet that evidence? This is called the likelihood. Um, and then you kind of go from there. So um, you look at the pro the proportion of this uh, of the farmer population in this case that also meets the evidence, and then you can um, kind of do the the math on that. And what we did was we just totaled the number and we divided the p of h by that. Uh, or divided the likelihood by that total number. So hopefully that's, like I said, that makes at least some sense. Um, just to put um, another fine point in it, this is the uh, probability of the evidence showing up in the non-H population or the farmer population. This little bar just means not and we're gonna call our farmers not librarians or not H, uh, since H is low librarians. So a few things to sink in there. And um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat, uh, that's making some sense. So, um... Stacy, um, I mean, what we can do is, um, so how far are you into your presentation? How much more? So I think um, this is probably a good place to let some things sink in. I, the the uh, last thing I could do, so I, I can kind of write out the, uh, there's the, the formula for Bayes' rule in a uh, sort of classic way, sure. I think. Uh, it's less useful than the diagram and just kind of breaking it apart in the diagram. Um, but we could certainly write that out and then we can kind of move into your- um, Absolutely, discussion. sure, let's do that. Yeah, so kind of the, the classic way to write this, uh, probability of hypothesis given evidence is kind of what you do. Um, 
it's not my favorite way to write it. I actually kind of um, have discovered writing it using um, sort of uh, uh, odds or proportions is a little nicer, but it's also um, a little more complex for uh, for starting discussion. But you, you're going to figure out probability of H. Uh, you multiply that by probability of uh, E given H, and then you divide that probability of evidence overall. So um, how likely is someone um, to meet the description? Uh, this is how likely someone is to say be a farmer. And this is how likely is um, someone to meet the evidence given that they're a farmer. So you know, if you kind of go back into our hypothesis before, that's uh, how you write it. Okay, uh, Zach asks, what do you do if you don't know the exact base rate? Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> there are a lot of cases where that happens and you, um, you can estimate, um, but there is a trap that you can fall into there as well uh, if your estimate of the base rate is way off. Um, so um, yeah, I'm not sure I have any anything better than that. Um, anyone else want to jump in on? Um, let's let let me go ahead. Uh, let me go ahead and talk about how I think about this, and then we will come to base rate again. Okay. Um, all right. So see, I the reason I, I I'm going to take just a, a very commonsensical way of approaching it, kind of non mathematical way of approaching it. See, I think all of us want certainty, desire certainty, and we try to grab onto certainty and make snap judgments. Bayesian thinking is all about avoiding this bias as much as we possibly can. It is, it is a corrective mechanism to this. So let me, um, so, so the kinds of things, uh, let me take an example. And maybe um, Stacy, you can help me with the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give an example. Um, so can we have a clean whiteboard? Okay. So let's say I text a friend. Okay. And they don't respond back. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me, do you think they're angry with you? And I would say, yeah, yeah, I think they're angry with me. Mm. Okay. So now this is, this is a classic example of how human consciousness normally works is that they make a snap judgment. Yeah, they're angry with me, you know. But the way in which Bayes rule work is, is to kind of go step back, look first at priors. Before you texted them, did you think that they were angry at you? What, what do you think was the probability? I said, well, I did not really think they were angry, angry with me. It was like one is to four, you know, maybe one chance that they were angry with me and four chance that they were not angry with me, okay? Okay. Let's, let's re redo this, actually. I'm going to write that as a formula. Probability of anger given, uh, oops, drew that backwards. Oh, come on, eraser. Given no text right. is, and we're going to say uh, uh, one in four. One in four. One oh. in four. So I did not think that they were angry with me before. Okay. Then if you ask them, if somebody asked me, like, suppose they were angry with you, what is the chance that they will not respond back? I'll say, well, well if they were really angry with me, I think 80%, you know, it's like maybe, uh, let's see, um, eight to one chance that they would not reply. Okay, so probability that there's, um, you're gonna say no, reply when I mean that they're angry is eight to okay. one. But then if they ask me, suppose they are not angry with me, what is the chance that they would not reply? Oh, then I'll start thinking, you know, maybe they have left their phone somewhere. Maybe they are in a meeting. Maybe they are there. Okay, well, you know what? There is a chance that they will not reply. And that's actually maybe something like one in maybe 
how much I would say um, that they will not reply is maybe one in four chance that they will not reply. Okay, so now with this, you can recalculate. So based on this, now you can recalculate what is the probability that you are angry? So that is almost now, how much is it? Is it, is it half? Oh, one is to two? Right, so yeah, so you're... Um... So the likelihood ratio is mm -hmm. eight is to one divided by four is to one, right? So that's like two. So yeah, it, it, and it may actually be easier if we did this as uh, instead of uh, ratios, if we just did it as um, as uh, uh, fractions. Sure. So yeah, but um, I, yeah, you would you would end up. It's it's probably. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if I have yeah. if these. It's about, yeah, it's about, I think one is to two, something like that. So like yeah. only about. Yeah, it's less than half. That they it's would... less than half. It's less than half. So your original kind of gut, you know, snap judgment was 80% chance that they're angry with me. But when you actually try to think through whether they were angry with you and what would happen if they were angry with you versus they were not angry with you, your estimate of that changes dramatically. Okay, so this is a way of kind of checking a few things. I mean, one, there are several ideas here. One is the idea of priors. So for example, in Stacy's example, the crucial thing is how many librarians are there and how many farmers are there? That's part of the priors. Kind of stuff about reality that you really need to take into account in order to make a judgment like this. That's number one. Second is the recognition that whatever tests that you have to figure things out are limited in their precision. They are never 100%. Whether it is, you know, when the, whether you're getting tested for COVID or whether you're, you know, getting, uh, you know, trying to find out, uh, you know, whether a person is angry based on text. None of these are precise. And you have to put numbers to, you um, how good the tests are in measuring what you're trying to measure. And that's where kind of the likelihood ratio comes in. And what you're doing is that you're using this likelihood ratio on your priors all the time to reevaluate your conclusion. So this is a, basically the, the real value of this method, this way of thinking um, is to not get stuck with your ideas is to be really open to the world. Um, so for example, Julia Gallef in the, in the uh, video I linked in the meetup makes a very interesting point because most of the times people look for evidence to support their position. And that's actually confirmation bias. It's actually then you're selectively looking at that, looking for evidence that will support your position. What you're trying to do if you want to use Bayesian thinking is to ask yourself, if I was wrong, what would I expect to see? So that's a way of bringing in things which, um, which your kind of system one or automatic uh, operation of your psyche will actually avoid. Okay, it will tend to focus on things that are consistent with what you already believe. So this is an explicit way of correcting for, for your biases. Um, I mean, I want to, uh, one of my favorite quotes about this, which is related to this is from Sapolsky. I don't think this is original to him, but he says, hold strong opinion, you know, it, it's about holding strong opinions weekly. So strong opinions weekly held. So strong opinions means this is again, a very important point is that 
any opinion you have, you should say, what, what would this predict? So it's okay, in action, what does this actually mean? And you put your neck out there and say, this is what I believe, therefore this is what I expect to see. So that is what it means by saying, that is what is meant by saying, hold strong opinions. What does weakly held mean? That means when you actually act and actually get the evidence, you are open to correcting it. And you adjust your opinions to match the evidence that you're seeing. And you do that on an iterative process. So this mindset of holding open the possibility that you're wrong, of putting a number on your certainty, watching the evidence, evaluating your measuring mechanism to see what false negatives it gives and what false positive it gives, and use that evidence to keep on updating your thoughts. That's what Bayesian thinking is, is all about. That, that's how I see it. Stacy. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, again, you got to go back to um, thinking about the likelihood of something happening, uh, like you said, sort of in, in absence of that evidence, and then applying the evidence, uh, and that and using that evidence to update your belief. So, uh, you know, kind of looking at your, your texting example, you know, if our hypothesis is um, we're, we're looking at what's the probability that they don't respond given that they're, or I'm sorry, that they're angry given that they don't respond. We need to kind of know what's the problem, what's the likelihood that they won't respond either way, angry or not angry. Uh, that's this, this bottom part. Mm -hmm. um, how, how likely is it that a person is going to be uh, uh, angry anyway? Um, and, and maybe that's a pretty small, you know, possibility if that given that person's personality uh, and then um, the likelihood that uh, they uh, won't respond when they're angry and then you can get the idea of oh if you know, how, how likely are they angry if they didn't respond so you know, breaking it down like that and putting the numbers in here would give you uh, a better example a uh, better idea excellent um, yeah. All right, folks. So what what I want to do, uh, Stacy, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or? Shall... Uh, yeah, the, the last one that I uh, I wanted to talk about is sort of a study on uh, medical tests, and I'm not going to go through the the full example, but um, it's one that uh, again back to my my favorite math channel, three blue one brown. Um, he does a really great job. Uh, it's called the medical te test paradox. It's less of a paradox, really, and and more. Um, I would say um, it's counterintuitive that you can have a medical test, for example, that has a really high sensitivity, maybe you know, ninety percent sensitive, uh, but that also means that it's going to have false positives. And if the false positives, say, are at the ten percent rate in a large population then you have to go back and look at your specific medical test and say, okay, given that maybe I tested positive for something, uh, what's, how likely is it that that's a false positive versus a true positive? And so the, you, you end up with this um, idea that, hey, even though this test is really accurate, that is on people who actually have the condition, the test can be 90%, 95% better accurate. That does not mean that your chances of having a condition are 90%. That's just the accuracy of the test on that slice of, if you remember my, my diagram, that slice of the population. Uh, so uh, it's, it's definitely worth checking it out. But so on this little slice, it's 90% accurate. On the rest of this slice, it's not. On the, on the rest of this big chunk, it's not. So if you test positive for something, doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, 90% chance I have it in absence of any other evidence. Now you start to add in additional evidence. Symptoms, uh, for example, can change that, which is why when people are asymptomatic and test positive for a condition, you really have to do more digging. 
uh, but symptoms, um, for example, will definitely come into play. Genetic abnormalities, um, population, and so on. So you have to take all that stuff into um, into account. And again, it's a it's a beautiful um, demonstration in that in that video. And it's actually something that um, that stumps a lot of physicians. Uh, they'll they'll just look at the sensitivity of the test and not the uh, the overall um, effectiveness of it and of other uh, evidence. So that's it. I just wanted you know, people to know those uh, that was out there and, and to take a look at that as well. It's definitely worth uh, worth checking it out. Excellent. So, um, so I'm going to we're going to do breakout rooms now. Uh, each of the breakout rooms has at least somebody who knows something about uh, about Bayes, Bayesian thinking. So let's talk about this amongst ourselves for just 20 minutes, and then we'll come back and do Q and A. Okay, uh, both Q and A and takeaways, right? So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. So, Stacy, are you back? There you are. Just in time. <laughs> we were just wrapping. We were getting really deep there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, we will continue to be deep now. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, folks, it's time for takeaways plus. Uh, questions, and we are going to take them one by one. So go ahead and uh, line up for talking about your takeaways and questions. Uh, we have four rules, as always. Number one, type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Number two, keep on topic, we're talking about Bayes rule and, and Bayesian thinking. Number three, be brief. Number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. All right, who would like to go first? You can go ahead. Tom, you have unmuted. You would like to say something. Yes, it's just a question to Stacy that was raised. Um, are there certain domains where uh, Bayesian thinking is irrelevant, not useful or harmful? In other words, where does it apply? And where, do, where does it clearly not apply? Specifically, one of our gang said, does it apply to considerations, uh, religious considerations, like, is there a God kind of questions? <laughs> it's, that, that is um, a fascinating question. Um, I, I, so, so the places where it applies, in my mind, and we're talking about um, one form here, this is um, one form of Bayesian thinking. Uh, there's also a, a different sort of continuous form, but in this form, it applies when you have a hypothesis and you have evidence and you want to update your hypothesis, your beliefs based on that evidence. When you go into questions of things like religion, I think that the issue there is going to be the evidence and the source of the evidence. Uh, something that uh, I think Francoise put beautifully is you sometimes hear these numbers, these statistics, for example, and you don't trust them because you don't know where they came from. You didn't do the experiment someone else did. If you don't trust the person who did the experiment or who came up with the evidence, then it's kind of useless. It's, it's not going to help update your belief. Um, so. I, I think that's um, part of the issue when it comes to applying this type of thinking to something like a religious belief is that uh, there's sufficient debate on the evidence that you may decide that you trust it and it will update your belief, but it's not going to be uh, universally applicable. On the other hand, if someone does a laboratory experiment under conditions that are monitored and trusted and, and reviewed, you may have a higher confidence in that result. Uh, so 90% uh, efficacy of a medical test, for example, done under the right, right conditions, you may trust that, um, but it's not perfect. It's just a matter of how much you trust it. And over time, you have to use some form of statistics to, to validate that, that it actually still applies. We have this thing um, that I, I, it's kind of funny. It's 
uh, in data science now they call it uh, data drift, where uh, the data changes enough that it modifies your your uh, later um, thinking or hypotheses. So you kind of have to keep up with that. If things change, if the truth changes, you have to update your hypothesis based on that. Uh, so I, yeah, I'd be really careful about that and, uh, and really careful about applying it to, you know, dating or something like that as well. <laughs> okay. V very good answer. And, and it, I agree completely with all your points. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, next up, is going to be Mike, Jonathan, Claudio, Kevin, and Jade. Mike, go uh, ahead. A, a comment and a question. Uh, there is something for the religious thing, Pascal's wager, where he decided, <laughs> uh, uh, he decided that whether you know whether there is a God or there is not a God, you, you're best off living your life as though there was a God. Of course, Christa, Christopher Hitchens turned that around and decided you're better off living as though there wasn't a God. So inconclusive. Um, I, I've been used to solving those problems as relative frequency um, mm -hmm. all the time. And that uh, is, is, that's what uh, the, some of the drawings you said break down to. And um, I, um, uh, I, I can rationalize if you just uh, blindly compute uh, that uh, you, you will not get um, in the Monty Hall thing 50-50, uh, but you will get that. But if you uh, consider the logic of it, that uh, he's not trying to trick you, Monty Hall is not trying to trick you, uh, uh, why is it not 50-50? And again, on relative frequency, Shrikant's example, uh, is there enough information or do we need... Uh, um, to get the total population, uh, did we get enough information or we need one more thing to be able to put it together? Yeah, yeah, you're right. We do need that one more thing. Um, and that was just that probability of someone just generally being angry. Um, and, and then we can sort of, or, yeah, or uh, probabilities of someone uh, responding to a text. I think those are just in general, like with, without the, um, um, uh, without the, the rest of it. Yeah, so uh, in, the, in the Monty Hall problem, I think if you, um, if you look at it with, um, go back to my thousand doors instead of three doors, what's your likelihood that in the initial conditions that you chose a door that has a goat behind it? And because we then change the conditions, that does not mean that your initial choice the probability of choosing a goat changed. You still, in a say a thousand doors, most likely chose a goat. It's super likely, right? So since it's so super likely that you chose a goat, what Monty is doing by eliminating all but the last two doors is he's changing the, the conditions so that you need to update your hypothesis. You need to now say, oh, well, since it was most likely before, the prior was most likely that I had chosen a goat, but this new evidence will let me update that prior by saying, oh, now I should really switch. In fact, if you could, if you do the experiment, if you just go and, and, and um, do it, you can even do it with, uh, you know, with a piece of paper or coins or something. If you do the experiment, you'll see that the numbers just sort of randomly flip coins um, as to where the goats and the cars are or something like that. Um, you'll see that it comes out uh, to about um, two to one odds. So uh, definitely worth trying it. Um, but yeah, it, it is a little counterintuitive. I get that. Um, and, and what makes it worse is that if Monty's choice is random, then now the, that all that breaks down and you're back to 50-50. <laughs> right. Uh, so we're going to go with, uh, we've got a number of questions, a number of uh, people lined up, uh, Jonathan, Claudio, and Kevin. Uh, if you'd like to uh, share your takeaways, ask questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Just want to tell you about the meetups coming up uh, before we go on. So at 2.30, we're doing a meetup on art. And we're going to be talking about um, how to use art in education 
as well as how to appreciate sculpture. Uh, we have got two special presentations on those. Uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we have a student of Julian Jaynes uh, talking about the core ideas of Julian Jaynes. He's written 18 books on that. At 2.30, we've got um, a specialist in Jung talking about Jung's red, red book and comparing it to Tolkien's red book. At five o'clock, we've got Dr. Um, Randolph Ness talking about his new book on evolution and mental health. He's, the, he's one of the people who founded the field of evolutionary medicine. So very accomplished guy. So those are, uh, those are the ones that are coming up. All right, so next up is going to be Jonathan, Claudio and Kevin, Jonathan. I have two takeaways. Yeah. So one is that there's sort of like two general uses for Bayesian, right? There's like statistical application, right? So plug in some numbers in a formula, um, formal, and then there's sort of like this heuristical approach. And I feel like there's a lot of explanations of the statistical approach, which are good and can be useful. Um, but I haven't yet seen a sort of more formalized application method for the heuristical approach um, where someone could sort of just have step one, step two, step three, to where they don't have to plug in a formula, but they could sort of apply it and, and have it in, internalized. And that would be great to see. And my other takeaway is this reminds me sort of like our current um, uh, information climate in which we're constantly getting headlines from the news. And uh, these headlines are algorithmically driven and optimized to tell us the most um, uh, attention grabbing information. So we're getting these feedback loops and they're, they're implicitly updating our biases. So Bayesian, think, like Bayesian thinking is sort of just a really uh, a, a formalized uh, theory of, of what we do naturally, right? And so, you know, all these algorithms driving these headlines are basically, you know, anybody in the world who says anything crummy can get more attention to the information that we really need to see. And we're all getting these personalized things. So I think this can be very really helpful in helping people sort of de, you know, tune their personal models to not be so brought in by this clickbaity uh, news climate we're driven in. So thank you. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I think um, on the heuristic side of that, o over time, so there are two approaches that I would take. Um, and one, one that's worked for me in other uh, areas is actually doing the numbers, doing the math a bunch of times until you start to develop an intuition and you don't have to do the math anymore, right? But there's also that um, that notion that um, that I kind of drew out that diagram. What I kind of do is sometimes just picture that in my head of where things fall in that diagram, and I don't really have to do the math at that point. You get kind of used to okay, when it, when I see that little chunk of farmers and the or, or librarians and the big chunk of of farmers, I get it now. It yeah, I don't have to do have to do the math to say okay, since there are so overwhelmingly many more farmers that, um, uh, that our guy uh, was, Steve was likely, uh, was less likely to be a librarian. Uh, so that, that is probably a, a good approach. Um, also the, the video that I mentioned on medical tests uh, uh, applicability, um, that, um, that helps to a degree as well. He, try to, he tries to help you develop that intuition so that you don't have to do the math every time that you can kind of just do a little bit in your head and, and figure it out. Uh, but for me, just visual approach that that proportions approach visually, uh, that's usually enough. Um, I, I don't even have to write it down uh, anymore. I can just kind of in my head say, oh yeah, there's so overwhelmingly many more in this that even if my percentage is low, you know, it can overwhelm or not overwhelm my hypothesis population. Uh, based on, on where I believe the percentages are. Uh, thank you. Next up is going to be Claudia, Kevin, and Jade. Claudia. Well, thank you. Another interesting presentation, important. Thank you to the host and the presenter. Yeah, I think this is very important, uh, Bayesian thinking, in, uh, in several ways. One way is that uh, it helps uh, reduce the fear uh, that people may have, because like in this day and age of the pandemic, people are more anxious, uh, they, they develop a higher level of neurosis. Uh, for example, when you people you get a headache, and a lot of people think, you know, like brain tumor or stomachache, colon cancer, you have an exaggerated fear. 
But when you base this particular, the statistical methods of this particular technique, it'll bring uh, a more realistic picture about, the, let's say, their financial future or their current health or condition. So in that way, it's good. It uh, relieves anxiety and it comes closer to the truth. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next up is going to be Kevin, followed by Jade. If anybody else wants to ask questions or share takeaways, they're, you know, you're all welcome. Uh, next up is Kevin. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I posted my question on the chat also. It's, uh, there's one band for the uh, lower po probability. Basically, they say the first digit maybe appear to uh, thirty-three percent or thirty. Then the second, the second digit is going to uh, twenty percent, and and so on. But when you roll dice, could be uh, like apply that theory. I'm not sure the basic theory thinking has that kind uh, connection with this. That's question one. Second one is my kind of about uh, this basic thinking. Um, basically, this the hypothesis divided by evidence, this is, could be biased uh, on the hypothesis or evidence. Let's see if let's see I I define a, a hypothesis and who select evidence, what's the source? It could be facts based or rational logical based or from the data source, where it's come from. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can answer the question on uh, Benford's law. Uh, I, I haven't really thought about that um, and, and how that relates to, uh, to this. Uh, if anybody else has some insight, um, I'd love to hear that. On the, on the evidence and the hypothesis, if either are flawed or, um, or untrustworthy, then you're going to get a bad result. Uh, and that's just, I mean, that's with anything. This is the, the, uh, this is the age old problem of mathematics and, and uh, to some degree now, well, to a greater degree, I guess now, uh, it falls into the computer science realm of garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if I don't have a good hypothesis uh, or good evidence, part of the scientific method um, is to invoke peer review so that you get more brains working on this and, and people can help to point out flaws in uh, either your hypothesis or your evidence. Uh, let me just ask a follow-up question on that. I mean, one of the things, um, you see, I look at Bayesian thinking, a Bayes rule, as one of the tools mm -hmm. in correcting myself. So that it's, you know, we, I, I did a presentation on John Boyd's idea of destruction and creation or using OODA loop. That's also another way of kind of controlling or kind of continuously updating your uh, priors. Mm -hmm. um, CJ, who, whom I work with for these comprehensivist presentations, he talked about, uh, I think it was from Polia, talking about, um, maybe it was Polia or somebody else, some scientist talking about the value of multiple hypotheses kind of working with multiple models and running multiple models and keeping on checking their, uh, you know, their mapping with reality. So the question here is that Bayes rule starts with one hypothesis. Now, how, um, how do you check for that hypothesis that, that you're starting with the, a good hypothesis or do you do multiple such things? So what, how, how do you come up with that initial hypothesis? Yeah, um, I, I, this is one of the, this is uh, what my friends call a consulting answer. It depends. <laughs> uh, sometimes the hypothesis is based on observation that you see something and you wanna test whether that thing that you have observed is true. So my hypothesis might be that uh, the sun rises at exactly the same time every day. And I want to test that hypothesis. So I would do that through experimentation and I would end up eventually proving that it doesn't, that it is a different time every day. Um, so there are uh, cases where it's just based on an observation. There are also cases where you have a sort of an unknown and there's in, uh, um, I guess this would fall into the the um, 
machine learning and AI kinds of categories um, where you want to test multiple hypotheses and you do what's called a blackboard algorithm where you splat out a bunch of hypotheses and then you have these programs that kind of go out and test those. Um, and you can do that also not necessarily in programming, but in, in just normal scientific thinking as well, uh, where you just don't know which one is right or even close. You test multiple. Sometimes none of them turn out to be right, but they can lead you down a path to a correct hypothesis. So um, it's, it takes a lot of experience to get uh, really close to a good hypothesis the first time. Excellent. Um, thank you. Next up is Jade followed by Zach. Jade. Um, so I kind of came in late <laughs> and um, I think I kind of, it, it felt like I got up to speed because um, I made some comments and Stacy was like, yes, you're on the right track. Um, so in some ways, I don't remember what I said. So I can't just go back to that. But I, I'm kind of, um, I'm feeling like if I were to um, simplify um, the concept, um, maybe it's oversimplifying. But I feel like in folk language, it would kind of be a things are seldom what they seem approach to um, critical thinking. It's like, no, 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 take a second, look at what you're looking at. Um, and see if what you're looking at is actually what you're looking at, because if it's not, you're not going to get the right conclusion. Um, so it's, it seems before I was saying is to make sure what you're seeing is really what you're seeing, but it, it seems like a vetting process within critical thinking, where you kind of have to vet even your, it's it, to me on some level, it's a way of checking your thinking, um, because it, it prevents you from making the mistakes of thinking that even if everything is in front of you, you might not actually acknowledge everything that's in front of you. And then secondly, even when you do acknowledge everything in front of you, you might not interpret what's in front of you correctly either. So it, it and I'm probably missing some other things that it helps you vet, but it seems like it's the, one of the real important things is, it, it, is it's a, it allows you to really check your thinking as you're making your, your whatever deductions you're gonna make. That's, that's all I got for right now. I like that, that's, yeah, that's good. That's a good way to, to, to put it, definitely. Yeah, and I certainly recommend this way of doing it, of always, whenever you're hearing any kind of complex presentation, putting in your own words, what do you think it is? because mm -hmm. that's the best way you can take it away. So I encourage everybody everybody to do that, of saying, you know, this is what I got from it. You know, this is what, you know, as, as best as I see it. Next up is uh, Zach. Zach, go ahead. Thank you, Stacy, and uh, also Becky for chiming in in the, in the group. Um, you guys have inspired me to, to study some more probability. Um, but I was gonna just ask, uh, I'm intrigued by the the kind of graph you drew, Stacy, and I think that's a nice visual way to to learn some of the the math. Um, as far as how to learn that, do you recommend this Bayesia.com that was referenced earlier, or is there, um, I don't know, YouTube channels or other places to to kind of yep. um, start down the the road? Yeah, I'm not sure about what uh, the one that was referenced earlier uh, is that um, is that the one that uh, Shrikant put in? No, no. Uh, I'll go ahead and put in both the channel that um, that Stacy recommended, uh, as well as um, as well as the site that I recommend. The site that I recommend is called Arbitol. Uh, I will put. So currently, I'm putting in. Give me just a second here. Okay, so this channel is the one which is three blue, one brown. So yeah. uh, Stacy, could you tell people a little bit about that thing while I look for the other thing? Sure, sure. That, that's actually one of my favorite um, channels. And the guy who started it, whose um, name I'm drawing a blank on right now, um, he, his notion was to put together explanations of mathematics that kind of helped him cement the ideas in his own head. And um, he started out, 
uh, the first couple of videos might have been a little rough, but he started to do this with a visual approach and with uh, with using graphics and sort of simple language. And uh, he goes through those uh, examples, like the one I did, several times in different ways. And he does that kind of in almost every video. And it, it ranges from things like how Bitcoin works to uh, to Bayesian thinking, to uh, just all kinds of you know interesting uh, topics. So one of my favorite, uh, definitely one of my favorite math channels uh, for sure. Uh, and that that's kind of um, where uh, where I picked up this diagramming technique um, was uh, from doing this the type of thinking that he's doing. Um, so that's where I would recommend trying it and just applying it to a whole bunch of problems. Uh, just find and there's no shortage of of problems that you can apply it to. Um, the one the the Arbital uh, site that Shrikant uh, mentioned as well has. Um, so what I did on that one, you can actually pick what level of understanding you want. And I encourage everybody to go and pick the super deep level. It's only 12 pages or so anyway. Uh, but do that and challenge yourself. And then when you run across those problems, some of them fit nicely into that type of diagram. Uh, and you can use that to kind of cement the the technique. Yeah, I, that that site is is I, I love it because it's very rare to see somebody kind of calibrate, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I would recommend uh, is to start with the simplest level and then keep on going up. You know, do do the whole pass on the simple level, which is the yep. simplest one, which will be quick. You will get a very good grasp of the core. Then you go to the highest level. You know, yep. it allows yep. you to kind of yep. scale up. And uh, and get get everything. Next up is Jade. Jade, go ahead. Um, so I have another thing that is not fully developed, but I'm also seeing this as kind of like on some level a logic equation. Because again, if you use just the givens and then you accept the givens as the givens as being like accurate, you will get a faulty result if you're not looking at what the givens actually represent or if what they're representing is what you, if what you're thinking they represent is not what they actually represent. And I don't think I'm articulating that well, but I feel like a lot of the data anal analysis ends up being kind of a logic equation type of process. But again, when you have the givens, the variables, the if ands, and you don't know how to apply the if ands and all those other things, then you're mm -hmm. still going to end up with the wrong thing. So, yeah, I don't know how that fits into it, but somewhere in my brain is saying that it fits somewhere. It, it, it does. And what you're describing is applying the evidence. Uh, what Bayes does is formalize how you apply that evidence. Uh, so you can apply it intuitively, uh, which is what most of us do all the time. Uh, or you can get, uh, you can also go into this more formal application of evidence. So uh, basically putting a number on what the evidence actually means and how much influence it has on the prior, on that hypothesis um, that, um, that you made. That's kind of what Bayes does is exactly what you're describing, but with equations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Cool stuff. Wonderful. All right, uh, folks, anybody has any any further uh, questions or comments? I, so I know this one thing, by the way, Shrikant, if I can interrupt. It, it, in the uh, chat, I did notice some questions about uh, AI and ML and application okay. there. Um, and uh, Becky gave a, a, an answer that I love uh, because it linked to Microsoft site. Uh, and you probably all noticed my little Microsoft logo. So I, I do work for Microsoft. Um, but uh, definitely you're seeing it at uh, the application in machine learning um, and in things like uh, you, you all use Bayesian uh, filtering every day if you use email. Um, uh, if you're like me, you don't do email every day like you should, but, uh, but every time you use something like email, those spam filters, uh, those are using uh, Bayesian mathematics because they will look at uh, what is classified as junk email and continue to, uh, to build um, evidence based on that that will help you to classify those, uh, those emails. So uh, definitely very cool stuff. Uh, so I'm happy to 
Okay. Uh, and I want to thank Becky. You know, you, you've done a magnificent job of answering questions uh, in the chat. Really appreciate that. Yes, definitely. Very cool. Uh, Wonderful. We'll have to talk. <laughs> yeah. That was really nice. Wonderful. Uh, all right, folks. So thank you very much. Uh, the next meetup will start at 2.30, and that's going to be on romantic art. And we've got special presentations by a teacher who runs a school of how she's using art as an integral part of education and what it is doing for her kids. And uh, my friend Sherry is going to be actually, it's going to be a show and tell on sculpture. How do you appreciate sculpture? So that's what is coming up at 2.30. All right, uh, Stacy, this was wonderful. Uh, folks, we have, um, Stacy did uh, meet up with us on calculus. Uh, that was fantastic. I would recommend uh, going and checking that out uh, as well on the 52 Living Ideas uh, YouTube channel. And we will see you for the next ones. Bye.